Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Many people say that man evolved from apes, but the Bible says man evolved out of the dust of the earth. What does Ben Spackman think about how man was created? We'll try to pin him down and see how far we get on that. Check out our conversation. Hey, I also want to congratulate the New England Patriots, my team, for winning the Super Bowl 53. Um, so congratulations, Tom Brady and crew. It was a lot of fun game and, and I'm really excited. So big Patriots fan here. Also want to remind you all to please uh, subscribe on our website. Go to gospeltangents.com and click the, click the yellow subscribe button. For $10 a month, you can get a copy of this transcript on PDF. Or for 15, you can get a uh, copy uh, paperback just like we have here, and I will be the first to send that to you. If you want both, uh, for $20 a month, you can uh, subscri subscribe and I'll, I'll send those both. So uh, if you subscribe, you'll be the first to receive those. So thanks again for all of our, um, our donors. Um, I just got a, a donation from New Zealand, so I'd like to thank you very much and, and appreciate that very much. So thanks again. Now back to our conversation. Now, could that be said with so, President Nelson? Because it seems like he's come up with some anti-evolution. Um... He's said some things on occasion, and it's never enough. It has never been enough to be able to pin down what camp he falls into. He, he's very obviously against the, um, the new atheist camp that says science and evolution disprove that there's a God. Uh, that's not a surprise. Whether he would uh, be in favor of, uh, say, Stephen Peck's views of evolution, a BYU biology professor talks about evolution a lot, or theistic evolution, or um, kind of evolution the way the Catholic Church has gone for it, he has never really said enough to to pin down. Um, if, if my memory so it's hard is to correct, say. Well, uh, because I. It, it seems like, and maybe you, you can correct me if this is wrong, but it seems like he recently ma made something about, of course, mankind never evolved from apes. That's a, that's a silly idea. Uh, if so, I haven't seen it. You haven't seen that? I'll have um, to check. I do, I do push back on people who say, well, he's a doctor. He should know all about evolution. Mm -hmm. And having gone through, I come from a family of doctors. I went through pre-med. I, I did, you know... Um, so not to say anything negative about doctors, but doctors are not necessarily scientists. They are more like mechanics, um, especially surgeons. And um, Of which Elder Nelson is. Which he was. Nelson. He was a heart surgeon. And if you look at when his training was, he received his MD in 1947, if I recall correctly. Um, that's seven years before DNA, the, the structure of DNA is discovered, before... The experiment that proves that DNA is the means of passing on genetic traits. Um, that is not too long after um, what's called the eclipse of Darwinism. That is, Darwin doesn't come up with evolution. It's been around for a long time. There's a fun little book called uh, The Secret History of Evolution that looks at it going back to the Greeks. What Darwin comes up with is a new mechanism to explain how this works. And... Uh, it kind of gets big, and then a whole bunch of scientists say, no, this doesn't make any sense. And so Darwin is kind of rejected. And you can actually see this in the writings of, um, of the Witso, Talmadge, Smith, Roberts, because they're, they're saying, yeah, Darwin's not really it. That's not evolution per se. That's Darwin's proposed mechanism for evolution. And um, it's really not until the 40s and the 50s that natural selection, um, genetics, which is a word coined in 1906 after they rediscover Gregor Mendel's plant experiments, come together with uh, the idea of DNA and fuse to form what's called the modern synthesis, which is where a whole bunch of scientific fields come together with evolution. His medical training and his scientific training are all five to seven years before that. So I don't know what he has read on scientific topics since then, or specifically on evolution or on reconciling science and religion. But I would not expect that either as a doctor or a surgeon, 
or given his age, that he received extensive training in biological evolution and is capable of, of nuanced scientific discussion either way. I, I'm not either. I don't study evolution as a scientific thing. I study it as a historical phenomenon between history of science and religion. So I often run into people online who have read some of my blog posts or papers, and they want to argue with me about cell structure or, or something. I say, I'm not a scientist, and I note that you're not either. So if the scientists who are doing this experiment, that generating this data, don't think it points in the direction you, the non-scientist, think it points in, where is that motive on your part coming from to, to use that to question evolution. And that's where I can talk about things. That's where I can talk about the history of these assumptions, the history of our worldview, the history of our interpretation of Genesis that drives people to oppose evolution. So I, I am not, let me be clear, I am not an evolution apologist. Uh, I think evolution is the best explanation for uh, all the scientific data we have, but I'm not out to beat people over the head with it. I am mostly out to defang it as a threat to faith by getting into history and scripture and explaining why Joseph Fielding Smith had these ideas and where they came from and why Talmadge had his ideas and where they came from and, and how, how all these threads intertwined in history to get us where we are today. I mean, that's, that's the fun of being a historian. That's why I'm a historian. How did we get here mm -hmm. and where are we going? Yeah, well, that's great. So... Um... Let's talk a little bit about your views then, and we'll we'll use the the classic um, trope or or whatever, you know. Do you believe that uh, that you know we evolved from one cell bacteria to to evolve into monkeys and apes and and to mankind and and that sort of a thing? Um, as you phrased it, I would say no, but that's because it's an inaccurate description of evolution. Okay. You know, we, uh, now, evolution is itself a fairly vague term. Um, a lot of people who have issues with evolution are actually having issues with abiogenesis. That is, how do you go from something that's lifeless to something that has life? And that's not technically what evolution is about. Evolution is about the relatedness of living things. Um, they are very similar. Why are they similar? How do we explain the similarities in things which no longer exist, which we have proof of? Um, but you know, we, we didn't, uh, we didn't descend from apes. We share a common ancestor. Um, but that, I, that is where the scientific evidence points. Uh, I, again, I'm not a scientist. I can't go in and evaluate their P values or redo these experiments or get my hands on the fossils. Um, as with most aspects of life, we kind of accept the scientific consensus, such as it is, and we fly on planes, and we cross bridges, and we trust our doctors when they say, I'm going to point this photon beam at you, and that will help destroy the invisible thing in your head that's been causing you to have spasms. We don't say, well, you know, I read a paper. I don't know that this photon beam thing... So um, I, I accept the scientific consensus that Evolution makes the most sense of all the data we have. I think the earth is quite old. I don't think scripture has a problem with that. And I don't think scripture says what most people think it does against evolution. So um, I'm inclined to believe it until strong scientific consensus overturns it with something else. Um, so the short answer would be yes. The long answer would be yes, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, well, and, I, and I should say this is a position uh, I have come to mm -hmm. so let's let's talk about that so so and, I, and I'm gonna phrase it and maybe this is an inelegant way to phrase it but but correct me I, I'm fine with that yeah <laughs> did man come from apes no no so how do you how did man mankind come well come man about? came from something ape-like uh, I mean, we are ape-like, you know, take us to the zoo, stick us behind some glass, and we're not too different from the thing on either side, right? Um, yeah, that's actually a scientific question. I, I can't nuance beyond that. I think we did come from something ape-like, and before that, 
I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, Something. let's, let's, let's scra- phrase it in a scriptural way. <laughs> this is where you want to drop in the Stephen Peck lecture, because okay. that's, that's his area of expertise, it's not mine. So, so we'll, we'll, you know, in Genesis it says that, uh, you know, Adam was formed out of the dust of the earth. Is, right. that, is that what happened? Uh, I actually like to bring that up with people who are opposed to evolution. They say, you think we came from apes? And I say, well, you think we came from dirt. Uh, you know, is that really so much better? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and that's what Genesis 2 through 3 says. Genesis 2 through 3, which I've done very little work on comparatively, as opposed to Genesis 1. Um, Genesis 1 is the creation of the earth. Yeah, Genesis 1 is the... That's the one that has the seven days of creation. It does not have Adam and Eve in it. It doesn't have any narrative with the serpent or the tree. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually a puzzle to scholars for a long, long time, religious believing scholars for at least 2,000 years, why we have one creation story where everything gets created, and then you turn the page and you have a second creation story where it seems like everything gets created again. Why are there two creation stories back to back? And, um, but uh, my general response to that would be Genesis 2 through 3 is speaking within a very specific context with an ancient worldview. And to read it as providing scientific information that we are bound to accept or we're rejecting the Bible, I think is not the right paradigm to approach it with. Um, I don't have a particular alternate interpretation to offer the way I do very much in depth with Genesis 1. Um, I do have... Well, let's go in this direction. Uh, A couple years ago, I was involved with one of the first Mormon theology seminars uh, that Joe Spencer at BYU and Adam Miller run. And uh, it was done differently back then. We did it online over six months and then had a conference. And um, those conference papers have been published now through the Maxwell Institute that kind of absorbed this thing. And uh, the paper I did for that, we did Genesis 2 through 3. And the paper I did for that was on um, the name of Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 through 3 and why it is Adam and Eve in our King James Version, because it shouldn't be. Mm. They, they've been mistranslated there as proper names, and really they should be generic typological names, namely human for Adam with a capital H and life with a capital L for Eve. And one of the comments by a fellow participant who is very sharp said... Just just that shift back to the names how they should be, how they would have been read and understood in Hebrew by Israelites, seems to make this Genesis 2 through 3 story much less about a particular couple in time and much more about kind of the everyman experience. Um, and if I remember right, Hugh Nibley read it that way at times. Um, David O. McKay approached that position uh, in a different way. He didn't leave much of a paper trail, so it's kind of hinting and pointing, but um, he he got away from reading Genesis as kind of providing scientific origins and being about other things. He was Concordus too, by the way, when he does this. But, okay. Um, so a lot of my online conversations when people ask this question, well, if you think X... Are you rejecting scripture? Because doesn't Genesis 2 through 3 say that there has to be this couple named Adam and Eve at some time in history and say, well, first off, you're making concordist assumptions. Can you justify those in context of Genesis 2 through 3? And most of the time people go, wait, what now? (laughs) Because we are just not aware of the assumptions that we carry around. Um, When people do justify those assumptions, it is usually on the basis of tradition and authority. That is, this is what Joseph Fielding Smith said, this is what Talmadge said, this is what Elder Holland said. Um, And those certainly carry a certain kind of authority and weight, but they're not unproblematic. Um, I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Ben Spackman. In our next conversation, we'll talk about how biblical peoples viewed the world. How many of you believe that the earth rotates around the sun? And of course, every hand went up. 
I said, okay, I want you to understand very clearly that you believe and accept something fundamental about the universe that is contrary to Scripture, flatly contrary to Scripture, and is a philosophy of men invented through human reason and observation. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Ben Spackman. We'll have a transcript out shortly on this conversation, and you can purchase individual copies at our website at gospeltangents.com shop. If you want to be the first to get a copy, please subscribe on our website for just $10 a month. I'll send it to you first as a PDF. Or if you'd like a physical copy for $15 a month, I'll be happy to send that to you as well. You can get our transcripts at our Amazon.com author page. I've got a link here, but just do a search for Gospel Tangents Interview and you should be able to find a bunch of them there. Please subscribe at Patreon.com slash Gospel Tangents. For $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview uncut. And for $10, you can get a PDF copy. We've also got a $15 tier where if you want a physical copy, I'll be the first to send it to you. So please subscribe at Patreon or on our website at GospelTangents.com as well. For our latest updates, please like our page at facebook.com slash gospel tangents. And also check our Twitter updates at, at gospel tangents as well. Please subscribe on our Apple Podcasts page at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. Or you can subscribe on your Android device. Uh, just do a search for gospel tangents. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript. And over here we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again.